Uh, let's start for today. So first we're going to do a quick review because I want to make sure you guys all understand why we're talking about tensor decompositions. Ron told me there was a bit of confusion about that. So we're going to have a uh, pop quiz. You guys tell me the answer. Uh, so this is sort of the really important part. Uh, let's consider the following type of experiment. So suppose we generate R unit vectors A1 up to AR in the n dimensions, where R is at most n. And these are chosen uniformly at random. So let's say they're chosen randomly on the sphere for simplicity. So two questions. So the first is, can we recover the AIs from given M? Where M is the sum of these outer products. A simple question, we just do this experiment. Someone, you know, not us, generates these R unit vectors uniformly random on the sphere. And all they tell us about them is the sum of their outer products. So we can think about these as factors that are you know, adding together. And we want to know, given just m, even perfect access to m, can you recover the AIs? No. Does everyone agree the answer is no? So I just want to make sure. I mean, this is very important for sort of understanding why we're using tensor decompositions instead of matrix decompositions. So I'm going to pull my standard trick and wait, you know, 30 seconds for someone to, uh, you know, ask me why that is. If you guys have any doubts about that, uh, speak now or forever hold your peace. Explain. Explain. Wow, that was fast. <laughs> All right. Um, so the issue is that these AIs, like, what's a natural thing you can do is, given M, you could compute, for example, the singular value decomposition. In this case, M equals M transpose. The issue is what the SVD would produce, would it, it would produce another set of, you know, sum of outer products. So let's say, you know, suppose we take the SVD. Well, in this case, since M is itself symmetric, the u and v we get are the same, so we just get u times sigma times u transpose. And what would the number of non-zeros be along sigma? R, right? You know, this for sure will be rank R, so the number of non-zeros in sigma will be, you know, R. So this is actually the same thing as sum from i equals 1 to R, ui, well, sigma i times ui, ui transpose. But now the big issue here is that these are not necessarily the same, nor actually will they be the same in general, because these UIs are orthonormal. Whereas these AIs, if I choose them randomly, there's zero probability that they're orthonormal. Right? So this is one example of this sort of rotation problem, is that you can always take a valid factorization and rotate it into another one, which still works. So the issue is that you know, when you're given M, which you think of as being like second moments of some sort of uh, stochastic model, then you need really strong conditions on the factors, something like orthonormality to be able to recover them, or you can enforce that, you know, it's a non-negative matrix factorization, and things like separability will tell you that you can find unique decomposition. So the issue is the first unit that we did was still working with matrices, but why we got that to work was because we required the factors to be non-negative and we enforced separability. Those are the two things that led to the uniqueness types of conditions and they led to algorithms. But in general, you know, when you're talking about arbitrary factors in some model which are not necessarily non-negative or of other properties, the issue is fundamentally given M, these AIs are not uniquely determined. Whereas the real benefit is that you know, now the second question I'm going to ask in my pop quiz is, you know, I think you guys can all hint at what the answer is.
can we recover the AIs from a tensor? And hopefully everyone agrees the answer is yes. I'm going to do the same thing. Let me pause, you know, speak now or forever hold your peace. Can we recover the AIs from this tensor? Yes? No? Yep? But assuming that it's not a line of decomposition in the first place, is it a line of decomposition? Nope. Uh, so in fact, the way that I've generated this, almost surely, you know, with probability uh, one, these ARs, these A1 to ARs, are going to have the properties that we need from Gen for generics algorithm to work. You remember at the end when I talked about generics algorithm, and I'll give you a quick review of what that is. When we talked about generics algorithm, what we said was that we recovered the decomposition up to trivial changes that don't change you know, what you get out. So there are things like, I don't know which one corresponds to i equals 1, and I don't know which one corresponds to i equals 2. That's just a symmetry in the model that I cannot ever hope to recover. And also, I could rescale these factors by scaling this by something, this by something, and this by something else that preserves the fact that you still have the same rank one piece. So in generics algorithm, you can think about it as saying that you can recover the rank one terms uniquely. So that was the main upshot, was that specifically why I talked about unit vectors here is that there are no normalization issues. So a generics algorithm will be able to recover you exactly the set of AIs in this case. Right. So, and quick, quick yep. question, just to, I, I don't remember everything perfectly, so we are able to recover exactly that Yes. One. We don't need any assumptions. No. Okay. Uh, we need assumptions that these things are full rank, but with probability one, they will be in this one. Okay. Yep. That's it. Exactly. Uh, yep. Yeah, this is a simple question, but uh, M is just... Uh, M or N? Oh, so how does this generalize to more than... Uh, I forget the word is what three by that three indexes like what a, what higher order, order. yes yeah. yep yeah. does this general does generics algorithm generalize there or does do, do, do this property hold could you recover like because I'm trying to understand why it works for the three yeah uh, order three tensor but not the order two tensor yeah which is what M is. yeah so, so uh, you know and there are no two simple questions for this because this is really crucial is why do tensors buy you more than matrices. That's a good question. What happens for higher order things, right? So what if instead I gave you a tensor which was AI, tensor AI, tensor AI, tensor AI? So in fact, one of the things I could do is I could just ignore one of the other directions, and I could take a slice through that. That would be a third order tensor, which would just be a scaling of what this is, and I would be able to recover that. So in fact, the way you should think about it is that higher order tensors only help you. In fact, there's a sense in which you can even do better. So if you work with like things like fifth order tensors, you can actually weaken the conditions you need on AIs. So I can get into that in a second. Let me review what Generix is, but that's a good question. I can say something about that. And then you know, before we move on to phylogenetic reconstruction, I want to make sure you guys have a good handle on you know, the intuition behind this. One of the other pieces of intuition, just for separating what happens for second moments versus third moments. So the issue is you can think about uh, when can I be sure that I've actually found one of the factors in my model. So imagine, for example, I gave you M, and we happen to guess U1, U1 transpose. You know, that's something which I can take U1, U1 transpose and I can scale it and subtract it off from M in a way that it reduces its rank, but it hasn't actually necessarily found me a true factor. Right? But you know, one of the key differences with a tensor is that when I give you A1, what if you took A1, A1 transpose? Now that's a matrix, and it's something which you can scale that one matrix and subtract it off with different scalings from the different slices through the tensor in a way that you reduce all of their ranks by one. So that's a very rigid property that instead of saying, I found one factor that reduces the rank, that's not a very strong condition because I can always do that for matrices. 
But if you think about a tensor as a collection of matrix slices, then finding a you know, factor which I can subtract from each slice and reduce the rank is a very strong condition, strong enough to say that you really have found one of the factors. So that's part of the intuition is that adding the extra degree is what's going to make the decomposition much more brittle. So it leads to you know, a lot of the computational intractability things that we talked about last time. But it also has a statistical benefit that when you find something that works, there are nice conditions that guarantee it really is something to do with the true factorization and not something arbitrary. Make sense? Any other questions? Nothing is too simple this early in the morning. Yep. So why is this weak? I still don't understand. Yes, so let me go through uh, the quick review of generic. I'm not going to prove anything like I did the other time. But the uniqueness from generic followed from the uniqueness of the, of the uh, eigen decomposition. So, you know, the basic idea for generic, right, is that what we do is we take, you know, Tx is defined as T of, you know, hitting it with some random vector x. And the same way we define ty as hitting it with some random vector y, right? And so the you know so this was just adding up the slices in the matrix according to the vector x and according to the vector y. And the key point was that even in general, what we got out of these things, you know, when we aren't in the symmetric case, but in the asymmetric case, where you know t equals some i equals one to r ui tensor vi tensor wi well what it was was it was u dx v transpose so here the columns of u are the uis the columns of v are the vi's and the entries in this diagonal matrix are just the inner products between wi and x and the same thing is true here except we get a different diagonal because instead we're hitting wi's with the vector y. So the key point was that now if we did something like you know, taking uh, tx and ty you know, pseudo-inverse, or you could think about it as just the inverse, then what you're getting Is you get this form. Now this is hidden from you. This is something that you can compute. But the key point is that the columns of U are the eigenvectors of this matrix, which you really can compute, and the eigenvalues are almost surely distinct because the entries of this aggregate diagonal matrix are the diagonal in X divided by the diagonal in Y. That's just WI inner product X divided by WI inner product Y. When I choose x and y randomly, you know, those actually are going to be distinct almost surely, and that means that this eigen decomposition is unique. So this means that I can recover the columns in U up to rescalings. So in general, eigen decompositions, when the diagonals are distinct, are unique up to rescaling the vector. That's the key point. So that's where the uniqueness is derived from in general algorithm. Right? So are there any other questions about this? Is there yes. a good way to de-randomize this algorithm? Hmm. I don't know of one. Uh, that's a good question. Not clear to me there should be one, because you really do need that these things are distinct. Otherwise, you know, you wouldn't find it. I guess you could try many things. Um, but uh, that's a good question. I don't, I don't know. It's possible. Any other questions about this? Right. So we're using the uniqueness of the eigen decomposition when the eigen values are distinct. That's different than, you know, for example, the fact that when we compute the SVD, we don't necessarily recover the original factorization. 